Good evening, everyone, and today we are going to discuss about a new chapter, uh, thermodynamics. We are going to discuss four topics today. First is about basic concepts of thermal uh, chemistry. Second, includes state function. Third, types of reaction, and first, fourth is first law of thermodynamics. First, uh, getting through the definition of what is thermochemistry. Basically, uh, we know that whenever a reaction occurs, um, there is either there's always a transfer of heat there's either uh, a release of heat or there's absorption of heat in order to uh, complete the reaction if there is no heat change if there's no heat change then uh, there will not be you know a particular chemical reaction we are going to discuss how as well in our upcoming part so in this case whenever reaction occurs we need to concern about the interconversion of heat energy transformation of heat energy from reactant to product or vice versa so in this case thermochemistry is a branch of chemistry which deals with the transfer of heat within the chemical processes while thermodynamics is a branch of physics which deals with the transfer of heat within chemical as well as physical processes now physical processes involve mechanical processes let's suppose if we are having uh, if you are having a car uh, then the amount of heat which is generated uh, by covering a velo by covering you know uh, a distance a uh, distance of 200 kilometer so uh, it's just an example and in this manner the amount of heat you know this is how we calculate the amount of heat uh, thermodynamics, but thermochemistry is something which is only relevant to chemical reactions, chemical processes, due to which we are going to discuss about. Now, some basic terminologies about thermochemistry. First and foremost, uh, the thermochemistry is a branch which does not study about the microscopic property, as we have previously studied about microscopic properties within. Uh, the chemical equilibrium as well as the reaction kinetics there is no such concept we are only having macroscopic properties in which we will be only learning about the initial and final conditions of the reaction but we will not look into how did the reaction achieve how was the reaction achieved now what does thermochemistry help us to, t to help to tell us and what does it not some applications applications number one Appli applications first and foremost number one applications oops uh, number one here is just it tells us about the feasibility of a reaction feasibility of a reaction that whether in the given conditions the reaction will take place or not and second involves the extent of the reaction that if the reaction is able to occur what would be the time taken to complete a reaction what would be the extent of the reaction so these are the applications when it comes to some of its uh, limitations limitations involve the following such that this is a limitation Let me just write it over here limitation uh, that it does not tell us about the rate of reaction moreover it does not apply on macroscopic microscopic properties so these are some limitations microscopic properties so this is how we do it apart from that when it comes to some basic terminologies basic terminologies involved in thermochemistry which has system so uh, we know that whenever uh, within the universe we are absorbing we are you know observing something if we are supposed to observe a system if we are supposed to observe uh, a chemical reaction which is between zinc and HCl so in this case when the chemical reaction would be occurring that chemical reaction is uh, being observed and that is under investigation as well as observation for scientific knowledge so these are basically uh, this is uh, something which is being observed in, in thermochemical terminology it is being observed 
under investigation and observation as a result of which it would be considered as the system of a uh, system of thermochemistry let's suppose if we are having zinc zinc let's suppose this is zinc and it is cl both are reacting this is uh, within a container and here this uh, container in which it, we are observing this system this is a system in which we are observing the reaction and investigating it is known as the system now everything which is excluded from the system including the containers free space is known as the surrounding or in other words we can say that universe consists of two parts system plus surrounding system plus surrounding is equal to universe so in this case uh, this would be considered as a system rest everything around us will be considered as a surrounding including the entire universe apart from this um, a boundary is a line it can be imaginary as well as real it can be you know physical it can be chemical but here boundary is a line which separates the system from the surrounding now it can be imaginary as well as real let's suppose if we are having a container in which reaction is occurring now the container in which the reaction is occurring let's suppose this is the uh, system now this is the system now here the container in which the reaction is occurring is basically the real boundary while the container while the it is a real boundary right it is the real boundary when it comes to uh, the system this is some let's suppose this is a system over here right so the line which separates the free space of the container and the system here which is this line is basically an imaginary boundary even though it is not uh, such a boundary but uh, this is an imaginary boundary because we consider it to separate the system from the free space of the container which is also a surrounding now coming to the next part we are having uh, types of system the three major types of system open system is a type of system in which uh, both mass and energy can be transferred now example of this includes uh, tea kettle tea kettle whenever we cook, uh, cook tea so tea kettle is having uh, an open system such as mass can also be transferred and energy can also be transferred a mass can be transferred in the form of steam when it comes to some other uh, examples we are having second uh, type of system which is known as the closed system closed system includes energy transfer it includes energy transfer but there is no mass transfer possible example of this includes pressure cooker uh, you know practical example pressure cooker is uh, uh, nearly an example of closed system uh, such that there is no mass transfer but there is transfer of heat so this is an example of pressure cooker one more thing in pressure cooker there are also some there is also a uh, transfer of mass to some extent because uh, till some extent the mass is also transferred be uh, because of the wall which is present over the pressure cooker which tells uh, you know to uh, whenever uh, the food is cooked the steam causes to you know uh, produce some sort of kinetic energy as a result of which uh, it starts to uh, alarm the person whenever he is uh, cooking the food so in this case uh, some sort of he uh, steam is also released of mass transfer of mass also occurs but it is negligible uh, it's not entirely you know but it is an ident it is uh, an example of closed system after that third includes isolated system isolated system is the one in which uh, neither energy nor mass can transfer nor neither heat can be transferred nor mass can be transferred uh, let's suppose example of this is one more thing that no <coughs> system in the entire universe is 100% isolated and uh, I'm just providing you an example which can act as an isolated system but of course heat will be transferred from there. Thermos flask is an example of this but the thermos flask is also having loss of heat bit by bit uh, 
as we can see that after five to six hours the tea or any other substance present within the thermos plus starts to become cold uh, due to which we can say that it is uh, also having loss of heat so uh, isolated system is the one in which no heat transfer and so mass transfer occurs apart from that uh, a reaction a chemical reaction to have an ideal uh, you know uh, a chemical reaction to become ideal uh, or to make it run uh, has requires a closed system we need a closed system in order to conduct a chemical reaction whether it is an exothermic or endothermic <coughs> now coming to macroscopic properties macroscopic property as i previously told these are not actually the properties which we are supposed to you know <coughs> study in depth we are not going to study on the microscopic level but at the macroscopic level that how it did occur and uh, apart from that there are types of macroscopic properties which includes intensive and extensive property intensive properties are those microscopic properties which are independent of the material or the mass or the matter of the uh, substance let's suppose if we are having uh, Let's suppose if we are having temperature, right? So temperature uh, is not dependent on the matter of the substance. Let's suppose if we are taking uh, 20 liter of water in one container and one liter of water in another container. So in that case, uh, both will have the same temperature, same uh, you know boiling point as well so boiling point and temperature both will be considered as intensive properties same goes for melting point as well as resistivity resistivity depends on the nature of the material it does not depend on the mate material properties such as uh, the mass or the length or area or volume so these are only dependent on its on uh, independent of uh, material properties hence these are known as uh, intensive properties intensive properties uh, but can depend on uh, inten other intensive properties just like resistivity resistivity is dependent on temperature so uh, intensive properties can be dependent on other intensive properties but cannot be dependent on extensive properties likewise when it comes to extensive property these are those properties which are only dependent which are dependent on material properties this means which these are the properties which can be dependent on other extensive properties as well as on intensive properties as well now let's suppose example of this includes mass if you are taking one uh, mole of water and on the other side taking five moles of water then both will not have the same mass obviously likewise moles if you are taking two moles and three moles if you are taking uh, you know a 20 gram of uh, water and on the other side we are taking 20 gram of water or 20 uh, 30 gram of water then at that moment it will not have the same amount of mole so it is dependent on the material properties likewise mass volume and uh, resistance are all examples of extensive properties now coming to the other part which is entropy entropy is basically uh, something uh, we considered as the disorder or how disorderly the arrangement of molecules is present within the system likewise if you talk about you know different system has different entropy uh, entropy is basically a state function uh, we are going to discuss that as well change in entropy can be calculated as the amount of heat transfer to the system in an isothermal process the formula for entropy calculation is equal to delta s change in entropy is equal to delta s is equal to q upon t where q represents the heat transfer and t represents the temperature now when it comes to uh entropy entropy basically uh, is directly proportional to temperature even though in its formula it is written as inversely proportional but according to uh, calculations it is directly proportional to temperature more generally a uh, delta s can be calculated as this but according to our book it is written as delta s is equal to q upon t where uh, as you can see there is uh, a condition given over here uh, which is known as k s k is re this is represented as the Boltzmann constant there's a particular value for it uh, which we are going to discuss in the next video and in detail as well so here delta is equal to q upon t apart from that uh, entropy is the maximum entropy is maximum in gases and then less in solids 
and the least in uh, maximum in gases, less in liquids, and then least in solids. Apart from that, a uh, formula for entropy is joule joule per kelvin joule per kelvin moreover it is a state function we are going to discuss what is a state function right now and apart from that uh, a basic intro about enthalpy as well what is enthalpy before discussing enthalpy let's discuss state function uh, we know that in macroscopic properties whenever there is transfer of heat tra heat then this transfer of heat uh, basically uh, whenever there is transfer of heat Uh, <clears throat> this transfer of heat which is studied in thermochemistry is not dependent on the path which is taken just like if we are studying about a chemical reaction occurring within a container occurring within a system particularly so in this case if we are supposed to measure the pressure then we are going to uh, you know measure the initial pressure and final pressure but we are not going to measure how did the pressure change or what was the mechanism behind it so that would be considered as a macroscopic property right so in this case pressure is a macroscopic property now <clears throat> those macroscopic properties or in other words macroscopic properties are only dependent on the initial and final conditions so uh, the initial condition of a system initial condition of a system is known as the initial state of the system let's suppose in case of pressure pressure which is initial will be considered as the initial state of the system whereas if there is final pressure then that would be considered as a final state of the system and in this case we can also call state as state variable and apart from that uh, there are other properties as well volume if you're considering volume then volume would be equal to vf minus vi final volume minus initial volume so as you can see within these state variables these state variables are not dependent on the path which is taken which means they are not dependent on how did the volume change or what was the mechanism behind it what which conditions led to change the volume the only thing which led was the final initial state so state function is a function which describes the initial and final state of a condition and is independent of the path which is taken to achieve that condition so this is what we call is a state function and example of this includes pressure volume temperature enthalpy change entropy as well as internal energy all of these are state functions some non state functions are also there such as heat and work these are these are not state functions uh, which we are going to discuss in the next video as well apart from that when it comes to uh, some other characteristic as you can see enthalpy enthalpy basically is defined as the total heat content of the body total heat content of the body so what does this mean this means here that total heat content involves the total content of the body which is present within the system now a basic formula which is used to calculate enthalpy is it is basically represented by delta h again change in enthalpy because we cannot calculate the exact value of enthalpy we cannot calculate the absolute value but we can calculate the change in enthalpy uh, so in this case delta h is utilized to represent it and here it is equal to E. e represents internal energy plus P delta V P delta V one more thing I would like to conclude over here that here uh, it is also equal to it is you know uh, in most of the system thermochemical reactions we utilize the sign of delta H to represent the heat transfer basically it is the enthalpy change so that enthalpy change is considered in the thermodynamic system because there the pressure remains constant and the heat transfer occurring 
is mostly in the, in the form of change in enthalpy, right? So in this case, uh, whenever we take change in enthalpy, we considered it to be mine to be taking the difference of change. I mean, difference between the number of moles of products, number of sorry heat amount of heat absorbed by products minus amount of heat absorbed by reactants. So in this case, this is how we do it. And apart from that, this is a basic formula. How it actually occurs is such that if we are supposed to have a pit piston, right? Let's suppose this is a piston. Oops, this is, let's suppose this is a piston and now this is our system, this is a piston, this is movable, flexible and now when the reaction is occurring, when we are providing it heat, when we are providing it heat, this is a heat, we are providing heat, so its internal energy is increased, its internal energy is increased as a result of which the effective collisions is its kinetic energy of molecules is increased due to which collision frequency is increased as a result of which effective collisions per second is increased as a result of which the as the effective collisions of the molecules present within the container is increased then molecules tend to produce more of the products and thus the volume of the system increases volume of the system increases as a result of which the system tends to expand and as a result of Vol increase in volume and expansion the piston tends to move upwards as a result of which when the system tends to move upwards it causes to give us the work done by the system previously this was the volume it was the initial volume let's suppose this is the initial volume after that this is what we call as the delta volume which is a change in volume sorry Del delta v or change in volume now here change in volume here represents the work which is done or the displacement which is covered because work can be represented in terms of force and displacement but in thermochemical systems we consider it to be represented as uh, pressure and volume here displacement is represented by delta volume which means change in volume whereas force which is used to derive that work is uh, done in the form of pressure so this is uh, what we call as work done. So this work would be done in case of thermochemical expansion is positive and in thermochemical compression is negative. Apart from that, when it comes to the internal energy, internal energy is also changed because we are providing it internal energy so it would be considered as positive. So this is how we consider delta H is equals to E plus P delta V. Apart from that, when it comes to its uh, unit, unit over here of enthalpy involves joule per mole uh, but we can also consider it as kilojoule per mole apart from that enthalpy is also dependent on internal energy what is internal energy internal energy is the total energy of the system present within it total energy of the system now you might be wondering how so it is also a macroscopic property it is a state function and we cannot calculate the absolute value of inter internal energy so we calculate always the change in internal energy change in internal energy and that change in internal energy uh, also involves the total amount of kinetic energy of the molecules the total amount of potential energy of the molecules but we are not concerned with that even though it in uh, total ener internal energy basically involves the entire kinetic energy of molecules now kinetic energy of molecules can be due to the rotational motion, vibrational motion and translational motion. Monoatomic molecules go for monoatomic molecules go for translational motion. Diatomic molecules go for vibrational motion and tri triatomic molecules or molecules present within a chemical bond such as boron trifluoride cause to undergo a rotational motion especially in a covalent bond. Moreover, when it comes to potential energy, potential energy is due to, of course, uh, chemical bonding, the attractive forces which are produced, and these attractive forces are due to both physical forces of attraction and chemical forces of attraction. Now, chemical forces of attraction includes covalent forces of attraction, ionic forces of attraction, dative bond. On the other hand side, the physical forces of attraction involves uh, Van der Waals force, all of the Van der Waals force. Now, 
this is uh, basically the summary of potential energy and kinetic energy but we are not going to calculate that we are going to calculate the entire internal energy which includes all the potential energies all the kinetic energies and for that we are going to find the change in internal energy this is how uh, we calculate it as well as internal energy is also basically uh, a part of state function it is a state function in actual and apart from that internal energy over here Internal energy. Sorry, sorry for the disturbance over here. Uh, we are here only. Uh, you know, internal energy. Uh, actually, now we are going to discuss about the change in internal energy. Change in internal energy includes all of this stuff, but we are going to discuss a macroscopic property. And apart from that, change in internal energy is important. Is important as a characteristic of a macroscopic property because uh, the first law of thermodynamics also based on this now coming to types of reaction uh, so <clears throat> so starting with the types of reaction in thermochemistry we study about reactions which involve the transfer of heat now these reactions which involve transfer of heat are known as thermochemical reactions thermochemical reactions and these thermochemical reactions are having um, uh, the transfer of heat represented by delta S which is the enthalpy change which is the enthalpy change so here enthalpy change represents the transfer of heat now um, in thermochemical reactions we consider having thermochemical equations which tell about the enthalpy change which is uh, re represented by delta H now the types of thermochemical reaction includes two the exothermic reaction and endothermic reaction first starting with exothermic reaction exothermic reaction is the type of reaction it's a type of thermochemical reaction which involves the release of energy from the system in the form of heat which involves the release of energy from the system in the form of heat such that if there is reaction occurring like suppose if we consider the reaction of hydrogen and nitrogen Haber's process hydrogen and nitrogen to produce ammonia now in this case when hydrogen and nitrogen uh, react they form ammonia right so well, this is a reaction now this is an example of exothermic reactions, reaction such that when hydrogen and nitrogen both react together they tend to <coughs> you know um, when they tend when they react together they tend to uh, release energy such that these reactants are having high amount of energy as these are having high amount of energy and how this high amount of energy is obtained this is because of the electronegativity difference now whenever there is an electronegativity difference it indicates that uh, there would be occurrence of an exothermic reaction whenever there is no electronegativity difference which means if electronegativity difference is zero then there would be an endothermic reaction now because of electronegativity difference there will be energy 
and they as there would be high amount of energy present within the reactants these reactants will have their potential energy potential energy of reactants or in general we can we can consider the internal energy right so uh, potential energy will be greater than of reactants will be greater than potential energy of products right so in this case when they will react they tend they tend to create products which will have less amount of energy less amount of potential energy but more amount of kinetic energy as a result of which these will tend to release that amount of kinetic energy in the form of heat and that heat energy being released from the system into the surrounding in the thermochemical reaction is known as thermochemical exothermic reaction now that thermochemical exothermic reaction basically uh, is type of reaction which can also be defined as the reaction in which the heat is transferred from the system to the surrounding and it gives a it gives a heating effect it gives a heating effect or warming effect it gives a heating effect to the surrounding now once the surrounding gains that amount of heat after the reaction proceeds the surroundings further um, what do we call it when the surroundings get that amount of heat the heat content of the surrounding is increased as the amount of heat present in surrounding is increased the surrounding starts to lose this amount of heat energy into other parts of the surrounding as a result of which um, the surrounding again gains its normal its temperature back to normal when it comes to other part over here uh, which is the terms a uh, term of kinetic energy kinetic energy here will be greater in products less in reactant as a result of which this kinetic energy will be converted into this kinetic energy will be converted into heat energy and that would be released in the form of heat and give a heating effect to the surrounding due to which when surrounding will uh, gain that heat energy the temperature of surrounding will increase but once surrounding will lose the heat energy that's uh, heat energy which is lost by the surrounding will cause the heat temperature of surrounding to again come back to normal as a result of which its temperature will become normal and again the same process will occur uh, it will uh, you know take energy heating effect will be produced as a result of which it will again lose energy as a result of which uh, its more temperature will be lower down right so this is how it works now um oops this is kinetic energy of products kinetic energy of products is greater than kinetic energy of reactants likewise when it comes to the graph this is a graph which we are going to uh, utilize to manipulate it most of the spontaneous reactions you might have been known about spontaneous and non-spontaneous reaction spontaneous reactions which are, are ones which proceed on their own non-spontaneous reaction which do not proceed on their own now spontaneous reaction basically involve mostly these reactions are exothermic reactions why because exothermic reactions have electronegativity difference due to which they release energy as a result of which most of these are most of these are uh, exothermic reactions but some spontaneous reactions are also endothermic reactions we are going to discuss in such a manner that here if we are having water if we are boiling water then when we are supposed to boil water if we are supposed to boil water if you're supposed to boil water into steam water into water if water is boiled into steam oops water is boiled into the steam so in that case when water is boiled into the steam um, we know that uh, initially when we start to boil water there is no change in the amount of water and thus no formation of steam occurs but after a few moment of time when we keep on giving heat to water then it gets the initial amount of heat energy which is required to conduct that spontaneous reaction even though that is an endothermic reaction once it gets the initial amount of heat energy in order to uh, get started with the non-spontaneous uh, with, with the spontaneous reaction it once it gets the amount of heat energy uh, as an endothermic process to get the amount of heat to proceed on its own for the next part or for the spontaneous reaction it then uh, even though after turning all of the turning off the heat supply it can allow us to you know uh, convert much of the gas much of the water into the steam so 
This process is also the example of spontaneous reaction, but that is an endothermic reaction. There's a concept of free energy over here as well. That as it gains much amount of free energy, it will have the characteristic to, uh, you know, after even uh, turning off the heat supply to turn into uh, gas or steam particularly. Now, uh, in this case, this is how it works as well as some common examples of exothermic reaction uh, involves Common examples includes <coughs> if we are having, uh, you know, let's suppose if we are having freezing, freezing of water, that is an exothermic reaction. Moreover, condensation, it is an exothermic reaction. Likewise, evaporation is an endothermic reaction. Melting, boiling are endothermic reaction. So this is how we classify them as well. Moreover. Uh, another terminology yes we were discussing about <coughs> the graph so this graph is basically relevant to reaction kinetics but we are going to discuss it here in order to just get the concept and here this is a reaction progress which is an exothermic reaction and exothermic reaction as you can see the energy of pot potential energy of the reactants is greater than the potential energy of products while in endothermic reaction the potential energy of the products is greater than the potential energy of reactants and here it shows that previously the reactants released energy due to which energy of reactants was decreased and thus it caused to release that energy in the form of that kinetic energy which was released in the form of heat energy while the products had less amount of energy which were you know considered to be part of the exothermic reaction when it comes to the endothermic reaction in endothermic reaction reactants had high had less amount of energy as they gained energy their energy level started to increase and as the energy level started to increase their kinetic energy uh, previously was their potential energy was previously less and kinetic energy was more but in product side there will be high amount of potential energy and less amount of kinetic energy ultimately as a result of which product had more amount of energy due to absorption of heat likewise when it comes to endothermic radiation you are much clearer about it that what is endothermic radiation in which absorption of heat occurs now in this case the heat energy will be transferred from the surrounding <coughs> to the system <coughs> so as it will be transferred from the surrounding to the system it will give a cooling effect <coughs> it will give a cooling effect cooling so from system to the surrounding it will give a cooling effect likewise <coughs> if we talk about this cooling effect we are having <coughs> evaporation <coughs> freezing melting these are all examples of this cooling effect such that when and exoth endothermic reaction occurs this endothermic reaction results in absorption of heat due to which heat is absorbed from the surrounding and once heat is absorbed from the surrounding that absorption of heat leads to lower down the temperature of the surrounding <coughs> but that temperature which is lower down is again compensated by absorbing the heat energy by the surrounding from other parts of surrounding as a result of which the temperature of surrounding is again maintained and thus it again <coughs> it's then again able to lose its heat energy and transfer it from the surrounding to the system so this is how it actually works and uh, this is a brief intro now um spontaneous and non-spontaneous reactions are uh, basically again these are uh, reactions which are considered in endothermic reaction such that most of the endothermic reactions are non-spontaneous but some are spontaneous as well and apart from this exothermic reaction does not necessarily you know uh, have to occur spontaneously because some of the exothermic reactions also require initial energy to start so every time they do not have the right amount of initial energy to get started as well uh, such as we are as we talk about the activation energy case in the case of activation energy this is the initial energy which is required to start the chemical reaction even in exothermic reaction so in this case that exothermic reaction requires to have the chem uh, have the uh, activation energy fulfilled whether it is an endothermic or exothermic reaction so in this case um, exothermic reaction can also act as non spontaneous now coming to first law of thermodynamics that is the definition which is uh, given 
over here by NASA. Anyways, we are going to discuss. It is also known as law of conservation of energy. What does it actually say? It says us that any thermodynamic system in an equilibrium state possesses a state variable called the internal energy. Between any two equilibrium states, the change in internal energy is equal to the difference of the heat transfer into the system and work done by the system. We know that work in that system is known as pressure volume work. And that pressure volume work causes to um, act as positive. If the system is having positive work, it means that the work is done on the system. Which means if work is done on the system, then there is positive work. If work is done by the system, that is negative work. Likewise, if we are having the amount of heat transferred as positive, then that would be considered as the positive that would be considered as the, um, you know, endothermic reaction. If we are having amount of heat transferred as negative, that would be considered as exothermic reaction. But if we are having endothermic reaction, so within an endothermic reaction, there will be, you know, work done by the system. Work will be done by the system in an endothermic reaction. How? Let's see. If you are having container. In container, we provide heat to the container and this is the system of the container, right? And now, <coughs> here... As you can see, when heat is provided, uh, and we are also having a piston over here, right? So let us draw an a piston as well, a movable piston. So when the amount of heat is provided, then the container starts to expand. The volume of the molecule, volume of the system starts to expand. As a result of which, it leads to expansion. This expansion indicates that work is done by the system when endothermic reaction occurs. Work is done by the system when endothermic reaction occurs. As a result of which, this work done by the system when endothermic reaction occurs is represented by W, while the displacement is represented in terms of delta V. So, <coughs> in this case, this is how we classify, this is how we write it. <coughs> and whenever there is thermochemical compression on the contrary, the work will be represented as <coughs> positive because work is done on the system. So this is how uh, we classify it. Moreover, this equation basically uh, what generally says is that energy can neither be created nor be destroyed but can be exchanged from one form to another. Such that if we are having energy uh, <coughs> which uh, is present within the system, it can neither be created nor be destroyed but can be exchanged such that it can be released or it can be absorbed in order to you know gain and absorb the energy as a result of which you know the reaction endothermic or exothermic reaction is possible now within that reaction it says that change in internal energy of the system is equal to the heat transfer sum of the heat transfer plus <coughs> the work done by the system sum of the heat transfer and work done by the system it is commonly written as u is equals to q plus w Q plus W. Now we know that within an endothermic reaction, as the amount of heat in an endothermic reaction, the amount of heat which is present over here will be considered as positive because we know that we are providing heat to the container. As we provide heat to the container within the surrounding, as we are supposed to provide heat, <coughs> as you can see in the diagram as well, <coughs> as we provide heat to the system. And this transfer of heat to the system will cause us to obtain uh, the expansion. Uh, as we transfer heat to the system, this transfer of heat to the system will cause us will cause the molecules present within the system to gain that amount of heat energy. Kinetic energy will be increased as a result of which collision frequency will be increased as a result of which the molecules will tend to have higher amount of kinetic energy due to which the work done will have high amount of uh, you know a negative quantity such that if work is done that would be considered as negative because um, within the piston the pressure which is applied pressure which is applied would be downstairs but the volume change in volume will be from upside so being anti parallel the work which would be done would be a negative work because thermochemical expansion is occurring uh, conceptually. Moreover, 
this can be represented as minus uh, p w p delta v y because we know that value of work over here will be considered as minus p delta v. Likewise, if we talk about an exothermic reaction, exothermic reaction will be having an inverse case such that instead of q, we'll be marking as minus q, and instead of w uh, as uh, you know minus p delta v, we are going to include plus p delta v. Now there are some important uh, points which I would like to highlight over here. As you can see, so we can you know have some constant uh, points as well. Now whenever there's a constant volume, there's constant volume. If delta v, the constant volume is there, then change in volume would be zero. Change in volume would be zero. As a result of which work done will be equal to zero. Work done will be equal to zero. As work done will be equal to zero, the change in internal energy of a system will be equal to the energy transferred. Change in internal energy of the system will be equal to the energy transfer. How? See, when energy is trans um, transferred, this will be equal to change in internal energy of the system. This condition represents that work is not being done on the system, but the energy is being continuously absorbed by the molecules. Um, in case if you are having monoatomic inert gases group 8 I guess is helium if you are reacting helium helium gas is there and we are providing it heat um, time by time and as we are providing it heat there is no work done by the molecules so as there is no work done by the molecules there will be the change in internal energy will be equal to the energy transfer apart from that when it comes to constant temperature, uh, one more thing here that as there is change in internal energy equal to the energy transfer, it means that molecules are absorbing energy and no, not performing any reaction. Uh, in this case, we can utilize the concept of inert gases, constant temperature. When constant temperature is there, then delta U is equal to zero, such that this condition represents isothermic condition. The upper one is known as isochoric, this is known as isothermic. And in isothermic condition when delta u is equal to zero then q energy transfer is equal to the work done energy transfer is equal to the work done and if as we know that if energy transfer is equal to the work done it showcases that there is 100 percent efficiency there is 100 percent efficiency if energy transfer is equal to the work done then this showcases 100% efficiency. This condition is not uh, completely applicable but uh, nearly applicable in car engines. In car engines, we provide energy transfer and that is 100%, not 100% but some amount of variations occur. So, I mean approximately 100% of the heat transfer is converted into work done which is to move the piston. Work done which is to move the piston. Apart from that, when it comes to Adi adiabatic condition adiabatic condition yeah. in which there is no heat transfer right so in adiabatic condition when there is no heat transfer q will be equal to zero which means in this condition change in internal energy of the system change in internal energy of the system will be equal to the work done change in internal energy of the system will be equal to the work done so in this case when change in internal energy of the system is equal to the work done it represents that uh, that system yeah. is having is having uh, work done then it showcases that uh, it is all right so this condition of 100 percent efficiency is applicable for adiabatic condition for isothermic condition if the change in internal energy of the system is equal to the uh, energy absorbed then it showcases 100% inefficiency 100% inefficiency in isothermic condition there is 100% inefficiency and adiabatic condition there is 100% efficiency so this is how we classify it moreover uh, this is how it goes and hopefully we will meet again in another video